up singing so much, uh, so well, and so much with your heart and your soul. I want us to begin tonight in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, through chapter 2, verse 2. That will serve as our text for this evening's lesson. And while you're turning there, let me express my gratitude to the Monday night group that uh, fed us this evening, us this evening in our worship. And uh, what a joy it is to be with you in this gospel meeting. And uh, thank you for all of your hard work. And most of all, thank you for your prayers. And keep praying for the meeting and, and praying for those um, who might attend the meeting. And um, hopefully we, along with the Lord's help, by his grace and goodness, can do some good in this community together. It's a challenge that we all face in our lives, forgiving ourselves. So how do we find the strength to forgive ourselves? Let's talk about it this evening. Nathaniel Hawthorne was an American author, and perhaps you've read some of his works. And he's, of course, was most famous for The Scarlet Letter. But he wrote a number of short stories that were really good, too. And one of them I remember reading in college and have never forgotten was called The Minister's Black Veil. It was about a Puritan preacher who came to church one morning to preach, and he had a, a black veil strung across his face. And the little old ladies that gathered in front of the church building every Sunday morning to talk, when they saw him coming, they were alarmed by it. When he walked in the building and walked down the center of the building to the pulpit to begin the service, he was wearing the black veil, and people were becoming upset about it. And some thought, well, it's just an object lesson because during his sermon, he wore the black veil. And his lesson was rather dark. And so they just thought that was the purpose for the black veil, but he didn't take it off. When he walked out of the church building, he was still wearing it. Later that day, he delivered a eulogy at a funeral, and he wore the black veil, and it made that occasion even darker. That evening, he performed a wedding, and he even had the black veil then, too, and that really brought the whole mood down, if you will, quite a bit. He didn't take it off the next day or the next day or the day after that. As a matter of fact, he continued to wear it, and his fiancée begged him to take it off, but he wouldn't, and the church board warned him that if he didn't remove the black veil, it would cost him his position, and he still wore the black veil. As a matter of fact, when he died, he was wearing the black veil. They buried him with the black veil across his face. And when you get to the end of that story, Hawthorne will tell you there never was really a black veil. It was a literary symbol or example of the fact that here was a man, a preacher, who could not forgive himself. And the spell that cast on his life was much like a man wearing a person, rather, or anyone wearing a black veil across his or her face. It would taint everything in that person's life or about that person's life, and it would hurt every relationship in that person's life as it did this minister, the minister's black veil. And how many people today are wearing black veils? Black veils that could be removed so easily and so quickly if they could only learn the way to forgive themselves. Carl Menninger, who was a noted psychiatrist of years gone by, once said that if he could convince his patients in his psychiatric hospital to forgive themselves, 75% of them could walk out the next day. The Bible says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and his word is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the truth is not in us. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, 
but also for the sins of the whole world. Someone once wrote that God, in his word, not only tells us he forgives us, he shows us how to forgive ourselves. And so from his word, how do we find the way or the strength to forgive ourselves? First of all, may I suggest to you that the scriptures teach we must first own our sins. There are a number of things that people do with the sin in their lives. For example, Adam and Eve tried to hide it. They tried to escape it or run from it, if you will. And it was Moses who tried to bury it in the Egyptian sand. And it was David who tried to cover it up. It was Jonah who tried to run from it. It was Peter who denied it. And it was Judas Iscariot who tried to escape it. And many people today ignore it. Others try to justify it. We can live with it for the rest of our lives, or we can do what the Bible tells us we ought to do, and that is to own our sins. And this is what David eventually did. He tried to cover it, and that didn't work. And then he realized the way to forgive himself was to own his sins. So in Psalm 32, David shares with us how he felt, and what he was going through, and how he finally found some relief. And so in verse 1 of Psalm 32, David says, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit, When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and my vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord And you forgave the guilt of my sin. David said his sins that he tried to hide, that he tried to cover up, nearly buried him, nearly put him in a grave, an early grave. And then he learned what God had been trying to teach him, and that is own our own sins, bring them to the Lord, confess them to him, and then trust him to forgive those sins. And David just did just that. And David found the relief he was so desperately seeking in his life. So the first step in forgiving ourselves is to admit we sinned. It's not to blame it on anyone else, but it is to own our own sins. And the Bible warns us that we can't run from them. In Numbers 32 verse 23, We read from the Old Testament that God said that our sins would find us out, and so they do. And so John warns us too, the New Testament warns us, in a similar way, but a different way, here in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And then verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So the first step is to own our own sins, is to think first and foremost about God and what this means to my relationship with him. I read the story many years ago of a father who was going to go into his neighbor's orchard and steal his apples. His neighbor had plenty of apples, miss a few of them. So he thought he would go over into his neighbor's yard at night and help himself to as many apples as he could carry. He took his son along with him to help him. Now, that's not much of a father, is it? When they got to the fence, the barbed wire fence, and he was pushing it down so that his son could get over it first, he looked that way, he looked this way, obviously looked behind him. He had his eyes straight ahead to make sure no one was seeing him. And as he held down the fence and his son began to get over the fence, His son tugged on his father's coattail and said, Daddy, you forgot to look somewhere. And his father said, No, I've looked everywhere. He said, No, Daddy, you forgot 
to look up. And when we're busily looking everywhere, all around us, our past, our future, whatever it might be, the side roads that we take in our lives, the dead ends that we reach, we need to remember, first and foremost, we need to look up. And had Adam and Eve looked up first, they would not have eaten of the forbidden fruit. Had Moses looked up, and not just this way and that way, he would have never taken the life of that Egyptian. And had David just remembered to look up, he would have never committed adultery with Bathsheba and then tried to cover up by killing her husband. The first step in forgiving ourselves, accepting or receiving the blessing of God's forgiveness, is to own our own sins. But secondly, think with me about what the scriptures say regarding making it right. Make it right. Own your own sins. Make it right. If we can, if at all possible, we need to try to make it right. And so what do you do when all sin is against God, right? You do what John says in 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the first step with David was to admit he had done something wrong. He had sinned. He was guilty. He needed that died as an infant. And David perhaps was blaming himself for all of this calamity he had brought upon his own life. So he confesses it, and then he admits in Psalm 51, verse 4, against thee and thee only have I sinned. And he bade the joy of thy salvation. David realized Ultimately, all sin is against God, and that's where you start to try to make it right with him. And David couldn't take back the adultery, and David couldn't undo the fact that he had Uriah, a totally innocent man, put to death, and he could not bring that child back. But he said, one day, maybe I can go to him. He can't come to me, but maybe one day I can go to him. He had heaven on his mind. He was a man after God's own heart, but his heart had been broken and stained by his sins. And now he asked God, heal my broken heart and create a clean heart within me, O oh God. The story of the prodigal son is one that we love so very dearly. And it's the prodigal in Luke 15 18 and 21, who owned his own sin and tried to make it right with his father. And you remember what he said when he came home to his father, against thee, father, against heaven and before thee, I have sinned. Verse 21 says, so the prodigal tried to make it as right as he could. And think about what the prodigal brought home with him. He didn't have his ring anymore. He didn't have his cloak anymore or his garment, his outer garment anymore. He didn't even have his shoes. He didn't have a pity to his name. What did he have to offer to his? But understand this, that's all the father wanted. And that's all our heavenly father wants. He just simply did it. Father, against heaven, against God, he had the order, right? And against thee have I sinned. And so we own it, we try to make it right, and three, we let it go. And you, I heard that song so many times that even now when I hear it, I immediately turn it off. But when she was singing it, it was so sweet. We videotaped it. We recorded it. We applauded it. She even did it in the snow. You know, there's Sven, but Elsa, that song, Let It Go. You know how many right with God? You, you do it the way God says we are to make it right. And 1 John 1 verse 9 spells that out. But then you let it go. And if it takes saying that over and over again in our heads, that's okay. And if you have to sing the song, if you know the song, and we'll pray for you, sing the song. Sing the song, whatever it takes. They have a... a they have a, a, a statement or an idea that you'll hear many of them say in their meetings. Fake it till you make it. 